Urban environments are the major habitat for humans now. Over half of the world's 7.6 billion people live in cities. As this trend intensifies, our global challenge is how do we make cities places of productivity rather than resource depletion and pollution. Here in Australia, 70% of people choose to live in cities. By 2050, this number is expected to be around 90%. Here in Western Australia, 80% of people live in Perth. Overwhelmingly, people choose to live in cities as places for work, access to services, and of course, social connection. As a young environmental science student in my early 20s, pictured here, up a tree, already a very keen gardener, I thought that by this stage in my life, I'd be living on a small land holding somewhere in the southwest, growing my own food, and living the good life of self-sufficiency. Now, this hasn't happened. I've chosen to stay in Perth. It's where my family are, it's where my friends are, and it's where I feel, at least for now, I can make my greatest contribution. Living in a garden suburb, 10 minutes from my office in Fremantle, with my family in a house that generates its own power, collects and recycles most of its own water, and where I can grow at least some of my own food is a pretty good compromise for now. But my main issue with this is that this can't work for everyone. There is a fatal flaw in this model in that it is space intensive, even if it means that we're doing what we're doing now on half the space that I grew up on as a kid. Perth is recognised as one of history's greatest examples of urban sprawl. In less than 200 years, the city metropolis now extends 120 kilometres from north to south, covering around 5,500 square kilometres. The resource intensity to run the city is immense. The cost to service the expanding city is immense. The health impacts on people who are travelling long distance is now well recognised and well documented. And the risk of people on the margins of this expanding city are at real risk of social isolation now and very much into the future. But sprawl is not Perth's only environmental challenge. We also happen to live in one of the regions of the world that is drying at a very, very rapid rate. In fact, the southwest of Western Australia is recognised internationally as one of the most heavily impacted areas from human-induced climate change, specifically in terms of reduced rainfall. And this chart here plots a couple of interesting figures, just to point out. Firstly, the bumpy line that's running up and down, that is the annual stream inflow into Perth's dams. And you can see how the downward trend is now to a point where rainfall runoff as it hits the catchment and goes into dams is almost negligible as far as it contributes to Perth's water supply. What you can also see there is that we are now relying on new water, and in particular, seawater desalination in itself, an amazing technology, but we're now at a point where Perth is relying on seawater desalination for around 50% of its water supply. And that water, of all the water made and supplied into Perth, 70% goes to our homes. And of that, 40% onto our gardens and about 20% down the toilet, down the washing machine. This is the highest energy intensity water of any capital city in Australia. Seawater desalination here in Perth, around four kilowatt hours per kilolitre. High energy water, and we also, despite the fact that demand has been plateauing, largely because of smaller blocks and less garden irrigation, but Perth still has the highest water use per capita of any of the major capital cities. Our groundwater, which we rely on so heavily in Perth for public gardens and public open space, is also under pressure. This plan here 
is showing areas of the superficial aquifer, which is typically used for our parks, and in fact, one in four private gardens too that have a bore here in Perth. We can see where areas are either running tight or in some cases over allocated, particularly that northern growth corridor. What that means is there's no groundwater left. We have an opportunity in the next 30 years to fundamentally rethink how Perth will be shaped based on new public transport infrastructure, especially light rail, and opportunities to build future transport oriented developments on these nodes. Let me run through some examples so we can look for inspiration around Australia. The Commons, delivered through the Nightingale model, a disruptive form of housing delivery. This project here is showing 24 apartments on a thousand square metre block of land, but the apartments are actually designed with participation from the people who are going to live there. So it's designed for occupants rather than for investors. As a result, the buildings are spacious, they have volume, they have natural light, cross-ventilation, they're thermally comfortable, they're low cost to run. The prize areas, the top, which is normally set aside for a penthouse, is actually shared space. In this case, probably the most sexy clothesline in all of Australia. <laughs> but it's a space where people meet, they spend time together, and it's used for a range of purposes. WGV by Landcorp in White Gum Valley, a 100 dwelling mixed typology medium density exemplar on an old school site, the subject of one of my major research projects. Here, this project is looking at a 70% reduction in mains water use, an 80% reduction in grid energy use through the inclusion of photovoltaics and building scale batteries, but also new approaches to service delivery. Here, we have a precinct scale water system delivering groundwater, essentially captured storm water, to all dwellings on site as the major source of irrigation. The main innovation here is the city of Fremantle have taken on this infrastructure and they will provide it as a service provider into the future. An unsightly sump, also owned by the city through the value capture and uplift that happened with this development, has been transformed, the photo on your right there, into public green space. So it's an old stormwater sump which is now accessible and also providing valuable uh, trees, shade and biodiversity. Central Park in the centre of Sydney, the old Carlton United brewery site, closed off for many years, six hectares, two and a half thousand apartments, 400 hotel rooms, a thousand student accommodation, 20,000 square metres of retail. A third of the site is left for public open space. The iconic green walls that provide greenery and people in these apartments with daily contact with nature. Perhaps most amazingly is in the basement of this building is literally a water factory. It's the largest package scale building located wastewater treatment plant in the Southern Hemisphere. It provides all the water by taking rain, storm water and wastewater from these apartments. It provides all the water for the green wall, back to the apartments for toilets and washing machine, all the green space outside, and is also now servicing surrounding buildings as part of the broader precinct. And by doing so, taking off the pressure of the old infrastructure, both sewer and water supply. But there are new emerging technologies too, around autonomous EVs. Uh, further advances in wastewater recycling and precinct scale energy systems, which will all transform how we plan and deliver Perth in the next 30 years. We need to be thinking of these things now, not on yesterday's engineering, services and technology. And if we plot this, where do we want to be? We see here, business as usual, when we look at the scale of environmental impact and reducing that over time, but also the amount of energy and effort and time and thought we need to put in to get where we want to be. We need to move past business as usual. We need to get past best practice. This won't cut it anymore. We need to perhaps even move past the notion of sustainability and flatlining. And we need to move into this space of restorative design. This is the space where we can make cities livable places of the future. Why can't cities produce more power than they use? Why can't they produce most of their own water, in fact, then use that water for other productive purposes? Perhaps even growing food, if not in, then on the city margins. All of these things are possible, and my proposition to you is, are we expecting enough from the people who are responsible for designing and delivering our cities? As city makers, we are literally creating our own habitat. How do we want that to be? Thank you.